So hi everyone, I'm Krista Averill. I'm the assessment coordinator for the main science assessment as well as for the main three year assessment. And so today's session is on rostering in the Adam platform and accessibility. Um, I will be leading the portion on accessibility. We have Bob Wolf with us here today who will be co-hosting co -hosting and leading the section on rostering. So just some quick main science assessment updates. So first thing to note is that we do have a relatively new spring 24 main science assessment proctor training video, which is about nine minutes long. And then there are also two assessment security webisodes and the MEA assessment security and data privacy agreement. So that only needs to be completed one time per academic year. So I am mentioning it here in case you have proctors who didn't participate in any previous assessment administrations this year. Our paper-based assessment order form is also live at this time. Um, and if you have any braille needs, please reach out to me directly so we can discuss those. We do have new released items on our main science assessment webpage under content, as well as some new supplemental text-to-speech guidance. So before I jump into accessibility, I'll just provide this quick reminder that all previous user accounts were removed prior to this spring, which included your district and school assessment coordinator accounts. So districts do need to reestablish their account by entering in their district email at adamexam.com and then selecting forgot password. Alternately, you can reach out to me as many of you have done, and I have sent along um, that automated welcome email from Adam as well. Your district assessment coordinators will create accounts for your school assessment coordinators and your tech coordinators, and then your school assessment coordinators can create accounts for school tech coordinators as well. Just a reminder, you don't need accounts for teachers or proctors. They use a test code and proctor code to administer the assessments. And any teachers listed in Adam were loaded from main DOE data in association with those classes. This will come up again, but just as a reminder, the main science support desk is full of information and you can also create a ticket by clicking the request help button or calling their toll free number. So let's jump into accessibility features. So first thing first are embedded universal tools. There are actually three levels of accessibility features for the main science assessment, universal tools, designated supports, and accommodations. And universal tools are automatically made available to all students. So in the platform, we have different universal tools like reviewing flagged items, uh, color scheme, flagging, bookmarking, and really the best way for all students to become familiar with these embedded universal tools in the platform is to participate in some of the practice tests that are available online. A non-embedded universal tool would be scrap and scratch paper. So this could be paper, erasable whiteboard, assistive technology device, your scrap paper can be lined, blank, or graph. But the expectation is that all students are provided access to scrap paper to use if they need to do so. The next level of support would be designated supports. So designated supports are determined on an individual student by student basis based on two criteria. The first is that a team of two or more education professionals with knowledge of a student's performance determines that the support is appropriate for that student. And also that supports are consistent with a student's normal routine during classroom instruction and assessment. And just note that the provision of supports doesn't alter the construct of any test item. What's being assessed does not change based on the support. So the embedded designated support would be text to speech. So that is when it reads the text both within the questions and the passages and the answer options to the student, as well as any text associated with images, graphs, or tables. And this should be consistent with the student's normal routine. So we have released some supplemental text-to-speech guidance that I just wanna highlight for you here today. We know that all students with text-to-speech are read aloud as an accommodation on IEP 504 plan or individual language acquisition plan must be assigned text-to-speech for the online assessment. But for all other students, this new supplemental guidance will help you determine if it's appropriate. 
So essentially there are lists of science vocabulary from the main science assessment. And if educators perceive that a student would struggle to decode two or more words from their grade level list, then text-to-speech would be an appropriate designated support for that student. So I want to highlight here that it's if an educator perceives that a student would struggle to decode, we're not suggesting at all in any way that you make flashcards of these words and present them to the students. It's really about um, you know your students best and you would have an idea based on this word list whether or not they would struggle to decode those words. I also want to highlight that it's decoding, of course, because text-to-speech wouldn't be helping in any way with things like definitions. So it's really if a student can decode the word. We have non-embedded designated supports as well that do need to be indicated in the assessment platform, just as text-to-speech does. And those would be breaks, extended time, small group or individual setting, and bilingual word glossary for multilingual learners. I do want to just note for extended time that Students with extended time still must complete the assessment session on the day it was started because all sessions auto submit at 1159 PM. So please keep that in mind when you're scheduling assessing for your students with extended time. Non-embedded supports that can be provided and you don't need to indicate them in the assessment platform or notify main DOE are things like assistive technology, medical devices, visual aids like external monitors, um, which I know probably MCD wants to interrupt me right there with that statement, but which can be used if the other monitor is disabled or turned off. Auditory devices are the student reading assessment to themselves in an individual setting or directions clarification. You can provide all of these things. You don't need to notify us or indicate it in the platform in any way. Some accommodations. So accommodations are for students who have 504 plans or IEPs specifically, and it has to be stated in the 504 plan or IEP. So things like American Sign Language or Scribe, as well as paper-based and large print assessments, Braille, and then Human Reader. So Human Reader is an accommodation only for students who need paper-based tests, as the Human Reader would be reading what is typically read by text-to-speech. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Bob. Um, hey, I am uh, Bob Wolf, and we're going to walk you through some of these slides. Thank you, Elizabeth, for um, pushing us through um, these slides. So, what our goal through this first stage of um, preparing for the assessments is to, um, you know, make sure that the correct users are there, the admin users. Um, but then also starting to look through your the students that are in the system and making sure that we have things like preferred name um, set up. So in Adam, when you look at a student's record, so that's going to be on the rostering users page, you can search for the student and you can come in and set this value called um, preferred name. This is used only if the name that you want displayed in Adam and in the student cards and in the student exports, only if it needs to be different. Otherwise, it can le be left empty just like it is right now. Um, but if we did want a different first name or last name, this is where you would, um, this is where you'd set that. So uh, again, the preferred name will replace the student's first name and last name if it's used. Otherwise, we just use the first name and the last name. Um, we also have the ability to um, update that, the preferred name. It's part of the accommodation upload. And it's, so as you're using that, you can use that tool also to update the preferred names. All right, next slide. So the other thing you may want, the other thing that you may want to do is um, update the student's accommodations, and that can be done um, supports and accommodations. That can be done in two ways. One is again in rostering users inside Adam. You can go to each student individually, and you'll see in that little screenshot the second tab down is called accommodations. And when you click on that, that will open up the UI interface for 
changing that student's um, accommodations and supports right within Atom, one at a time. So you would update the accommodations, then at the bottom of the page, click the submit button or save. I can't remember which one is at the bottom. Um, and that will save that record. Setting accommodations is very important for you to handle early um, in this process. There's a automatic process that happens um, every, every 30 minutes that will take whatever the accommodation is of the student and update that into the, the test administration. We want to make sure that our accommodations are set in advance. So waiting until the day of testing is probably not the best time to go and set your accommodations. Try to get that taken care of with your students um, as soon as possible. Um, let's see what happens on the next slide here. Okay, great. So this is um, kind of going through this, the upload piece. So if you want to do a kind of a mass upload of accommodations, um, you can, in, in this particular case, we've gone in as a school coordinator um, filtered by the organization, in this case, a school. We looked for um, students by role and then said, I want to look at all my fifth graders. And then you can use the option, and the, the option's already been picked there, but there's a, the underneath where it says results, and we're now seeing select all, select page, deselect page. You could, in this case, select all of your fifth graders, which is, is 78 kids. And let's go to the next slide. Then up in the top right-hand corner of that page, in that little kebab menu, there will be several options for, for functions that you may have access to. One of them is called student accommodation upload. And so let me explain now that we're seeing this screen as well. The reason we selected students first is because they are going to be pulled into this template process um, in the next screen. And that will show us a list of all of the kids and their current accommodations. And then we can update those as we move forward. So what we were talking about is the um, accommodation upload process. So um, again, I'm gonna have Susan go over to rostering users. And we're just gonna pick, um, let's just grab two students. So like Jaden Woods and Lance Patton, just put a check mark in front of those two kids' names. Perfect. We're gonna go to the kebab menu up in the top right and click on student accommodation upload. All right, so what we're looking at here is going to walk us through exactly what we have to do. In step one, it's letting us know what accommodations we have access to. Some of these are locked. You can see like Braille, we, um, you have to have special permissions in order to set those. Um, large print, paper-based. The other accommodations are um, on and will be available for us. So part of step one is to click to create template. So when Susan does that, that's going to create a template with those two students in it that we selected. So this will open up. Um, however you um, open up your text files, this is a little different than it was last year. So you'll notice that that green message popped up and said, hey, we, we're downloading something for you. We're creating this template. So instead of that just opening on your screen like it did before, there's a new place up in the top right hand of the screen called template history. This is where you're going to get your templates. This is also where you're going to continuously be able to find them if you're doing this download. So you can see these templates. So um, this tells us when this template was, was originally downloaded. And there's a little download icon just to the right of the name. We'll go ahead and click that. That will allow us now to open this CSV. And it will ask us if we how we want to open this and we're gonna to wanna to open it with Excel usually. It could be numbers, it could be whatever you're used to um, using. So when we look at this um, template, uh, we have our, our 
first co our first row, which is the um, the list of all of the labels for all of the accommodations that are that we have access to. And then we see our two students. Um, eventually, once you get to column D and E, that's going to be the students' names. And you don't need to do anything with any of those values um, all the way up until column K, which is um, all of that is information you don't change. But then what we start to get into column L going forward through through V, I believe, these are all of the accommodations that you can set. Um, if you want to turn an accommodation on for the student, you place a one in the cell that you're turning on. So if you wanted bilingual word glossary turned on for Lance, you would put a one in that cell. Um, and that goes for all the rest of them. They're all going to be, they can either be a one, they can be a zero or a blank. Zero and blank are the same thing. They just mean um, not on. I'm gonna, there's another, um, this shouldn't cause you a problem, but a space is different than a blank. So we don't want anything in that field if you want it to be off. Um, once you, so Susan has Texas speech turned on for um, the, our first student here and a couple of other accommodations turned on. Now we're gonna save this file. This file needs to be saved still as a CSV. So if you click up on the save icon um, for, your, for your sheet, Susan, Yeah, I just would do a save. <laughs> and you can you do a save as, that way you can make sure that you're saving this as a CSV. Or, or the pencil like uh, save up there. And now we have saved this um, template out um, someplace. In this case, it saved it to, to Susan's Mac. So now if you go to the Atom screen behind this, and you can close the template history, just a little close button up in the right. And that's step one, get your template, populate it with your data. Then we're going to move over to step, sorry, step two is what we just did, which was going into the um, sheet and setting the values either one or a zero. And then we've saved that, so we're going to scroll down a little bit to step three. And this is where you go grab that file that you just saved. So you can browse to it. You can drag it in there if you have the file somewhere somewhere you can find. But we'll just browse out, find that file. All right, so Susan was able to find that file, thank you, and put it into this spot. Now, what it does right away, what Adam does, is it looks at that file, it evaluates that file and says, you have X amount of rows in there and each row re represents a student. So in this case, it found two students. So that's, that's kind of step one. You could get errors there, but not very likely. Um, and then what we'll do is click on upload. Now it really evaluates that file and it is going to try to put the, that information into Atom. Again, this is different than it was last year. If you scroll up to the top of the page and go to upload history. So now this is what we just did. We brought the data back into Atom. And if you click into upload history, it'll show you your file or the name that you just brought in. It says how many profiles were part of that, tells you if it succeeded or not. If it had failed, it would have put a status of failed in here. And you can download that file again, and it will tell you exactly what's wrong with that. Um, you, you put an incorrect character in, or it can't find the student, or whatever. It really is really good uh, information on there as to who's putting, uh, or what the error might be. Um, this is another, if you, the other reason that this is put in, if you did a really large upload, um, you know, for some reason, Krista went in and uploaded the accommodations for every student in the state. Um, that will take longer. And instead of freezing your screen, it's going into this upload history. This will run in the background process. You don't have to wait for it. 
um, you can also always come back and find those files that you uploaded, which is also great because you can go back and say, oh, why does this student have this accommodation? Oh, that's right, part of my upload. And I can go look to see how I set those. Um, so this should be done. You can go ahead and close this window. And we'll go back to rostering users. And yeah, it was those first two kids. Let's modify um, Jaden Woods in actions. And then go to accommodations. And if we scroll down, we'll see if we have any of those local accommodations set. There they are. Extended time, frequent breaks is turned on. Um, and we can go back to users. We can choose our other student. I me remember Susan and set text to speech on that one. So let's look at Peyton, Lance Payton or Patton and accommodations and see if text to speech is turned on. Okay, great. So at any time you can use that upload process. If you don't have a lot of kids with accommodations, sometimes it's just easier to go into them and set them. So the idea behind um, our, our whole, whole rostering process is one, we want to make sure our kids are um, in the right school. So do you have all the right students and um, making sure that they're there. The second thing that we want to do is make sure that all of our students are in a class. And I have some classes for some of these students in this school. Um, and I have others that don't that aren't in classes. So the fifth column in the, the rostering list is a column called classes. And that shows you and there's a little icon and that will you can hover over that it'll tell you what the class name is. But all of those students that don't have a class associated with them. Those are the ones without the icons. For us, we've called this unrostered. So if they're not in a class, they're considered unrostered. You can easily get a list of all of your unrostered kids by in right where Susan is in the filter. You can just click on that show unrostered and it'll just show you all of the kids that you don't have currently in a class. There are several methods that you can go through to put students into classes um, and those instructions are, are in your guide, which include things like going into rostering classes and creating a class and then going into a student and adding that student into a specific class. And you'll probably do that if you have onesie, twosie kids that you want to move around between classes. But what I really wanna show you is this quick class upload that lets you manage your classes um, much, uh, much faster than doing them all one or doing them one at a time. So we're going to now navigate over to rostering classes. You may um, be doing this process where you have classes that exist already, um, or you may come to the screen and there are no classes um, in here. And those, that's really the, the instance that I want to talk about, which is using this process of called quick class upload to not only create your class, but also roster students into those classes all at the same time using one file. It's super easy to do. Um, and Susan, while you're on this page, if you click on create new up in the top right for classes, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of fields in here to populate title and class code and location and class type and school and course and on and on. And yes, there's instructions on how to fill this out to create a class one at a time, um, but we've really streamlined this. So go ahead and hit cancel on this page for us. And we're going to start on rostering classes in our menu. And then up in the top right, we're gonna click in the kebab menu again, and we're gonna click on quick class upload. And you have a nice document that explains how this works, but it's a three-step process, just like we saw with um, uploading account uh, uh, accommodations. Um, step one is going to have us fill out information that's um, going to pre-populate some of the information on that class when you're creating a new class. So the example that I have for this particular school coordinator, uh, she has 
some high school kids that are ready to be um, put into a class. So quick class upload can only be done for one grade at a time, for one school at a time. So in, we're going to choose grade of HS for high school. Um, actually, no. We are going to choose grade, the actual grade of the students this year. Upload. Select 11th grade. Last year when you did this, you would have chosen just high school because we had our kids all rostered um, as the grade of high school. This year we've chosen to do some reporting a little bit differently. So we have those, all those high school kids um, by the actual grade that they are in. So you'll, when you're rostering or doing this quick class upload for those students that are in their third year, um, you'll need to pick their actual year that they are in school and do them separately. So 11th, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, if they're in there. Um, so in this case, we're gonna choose 11th grade, the course. And while he's doing that, um, the even though you'll up do the quick class upload by grade level, grade 11, grade 10, grade 12, if you have those students, they can still be joined together in a single class or a single proctor group for administering the test. Um, once they're loaded, but the quick class upload function itself can only do one grade level at a time. Not try course. Okay, good. So if you're choosing anything that's um, a high school grade, it's going to be tied to a high school science course. If you're doing eighth grade, it's going to choose an eighth grade course. So you should never actually have to choose that course value. Academic session then. Go ahead and choose 23, 24. And then your school. We're logged in as a school coordinator, so there should only be one school available. And then we're going to click in, to download the template again. So this will um, open up a, or allow you to open up the template similar to, to the template that we created for accommodations. It will include the students that are um, available to be put into classes. see it. This file is very simple. Um, we're only going to be making edits to one of the columns here, which is that last column um, called class code. What we've done here is brought in those two students. In this case, there's only two students that don't have a class already. So that's why they were both brought in. And what we want to do is define the class it says class code. It is going to use whatever you type in that value for the new class that's going to be created. So it's the class title. It's also going to be the proctor group name. It's also going to be the class code. So we're just calling them all the same thing. Um, so in uh, your naming convention, can, I don't think that the state has anything that they want us to be setting this at. But I like to do something like the name of the, if it's a a teacher and the course and um, the room number, it's, it's kind of up to you. Um, but I do like it to be recognizable. So if somebody else is looking at the list of all the classes that have been created, they might be able to tell the difference between your class and somebody else whose name is Bob, for example. Um, so just or just calling it class name, that would be a pretty bad idea. We wouldn't necessarily be able to find that. There are some in your documentation, there are some suggestions as to what you might want to call your classes. And for us, we're going to um, create, this would be a very silly class, but we're going to create two classes. We're going to create this one called Bob Demo Class 1, and we're going to create another class called Bob Demo Class 2. What this is going to do is it's going to now create two classes, and it will put Jaden Woods into Bob Demo Class 1, and we'll put Lance Patton into Bob Demo Class 2. Again, the only change that you're making here is putting something into class code. So go ahead and save this. Again, it's going to be saved as a CSV. And then we'll go back to Adam, and we will upload that file. If 
you have not provided a class code in that column called class code, you're going to get a couple error messages that reminding you to do that. And that's um, why I got the error message the first time is that I just uploaded the same file. I had just downloaded the template and hadn't made any changes to it. So it told cool. me that I needed to make changes. <laughs> All right. So again, like uh, when we did accommodations, um, it's telling us just based off of that file, what is it going to do? In this case, it added two classes and enrolled two kids. Um, so now we can see in the rostering classes, we can see at the bottom of the list, those two classes called Bob Demo Class 1, Bob Demo Class 2. Um, the sixth column over says students, and it has a student in each one of those. If we modify one of these classes, we'll see information about, more information about the class. Um, again, you don't need to change any of this information that's in there. We built it all. Um, and there is your student at the very bottom. So if you do come to a point where you want to add a student to a class that already exists and you wanna do it one at a time, you can come into the class, click add student, bring the student in by clicking up. Yeah, go ahead and add Mara. And you can scroll down to the bottom of this page and I think there's a done and you can submit at the very bottom of this page to add that student. Okay. okay. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna say this um, uh, again, because it is very important. The class name, or in this case, the class title is used to create, it's used uh, to create the proctor group once we start to, once we enable administrations for you. So you're, that's kind of what you want to manage in here. You're looking at the classes that you have, make sure your students are all in a class, and the name of that class is going to be the name of the, the, the proctor group that gets built. You still have the option, we'll talk about proctoring um, in a couple weeks, um, but you'll still have the ability to create alias proctor groups. Um, I just like to make sure that everyone is very comfortable with two things with classes. One, that that class is going to be that kind of will be turned into a proctor group for you. So create classes that are, uh, create the classes that you want to become proctor groups. I guess that's what I want to say. So I think um, there was a question. So just clarification, main DOE does roster all of your students into Adam. And so all of your students already appear with an Adam, it's then just your responsibility to ensure that they're also rostered to a class. Um, but those students will already appear there. So if there's a student that is there that you think should not be there, or a student that you believe should be there but is not, um, you'd want to reach out either to me or to the Madam's help desk regarding that. Thanks, Krista. That's great. And Krista's right on top of things yes this is exactly right so um maine has already rostered students um so you should see them right away and so be verifying that the students are in the right spot um if they're not we want to make sure we fix that at the state level so that we it so that it matches up with what's in synergy or not synergy um your data file make we want to make sure that those two things match up um Right, the rostering, the roster, the all of these kids, if they're in a special purpose private school or out of state school or regional, um, they're going to be rostered in that where they receive instruction. Um, and did we ch we didn't change anything this year with with homes homeschool students, right? They will be um, rostered into um, whatever their whatever the state school is. Is that right, Krista? Yes, yeah, so your home instruction students who have their FTE status of one through four, so your partially homeschooled students will appear in the roster for that school. If you have a homeschooling family who does not participate in public education and would like to participate in the assessment, you would roster that student in Synergy 
as a partially homeschooled student, and then the student will automatically appear on your assessment rosters. Your partially homeschooled students are not required to be assessed, however. So because part of their instruction is publicly funded, we're required to offer them the opportunity to assess. But please be aware if you have a student who only receives publicly funded instruction for music, you are not required to administer the main science assessment to them. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, I want to talk a little bit about Synergy and NEO also, and not necessarily for students, but ultimately that's, that is where you're, you're going to go and make sure that the data matches there because that's where we're going to pull it from, but also for your, your district coordinators and, uh, and uh, and the state, the, that information is also um, there. And so when we are helping you from the support desk, we are going to be, we can help you up to a certain point to make sure that, that those people are, are correct. But if it doesn't match with what's in Synergy, we're, our hands are kind of tied. So then those requests will come back to Krista also to set up like new district person if the wrong district person is set up for you, um, which you probably already figured out that piece. Um, all right, next slide, if there is one. Okay, so this is just that reminder of what we just did. Um, part of what we have prepared for you is um, by having a, a bunch of articles that are out there um, in Zendesk for you to help with all of these pieces. So by using keywords, yeah, go ahead. Is Steve. that coming next? By mm -hmm. using keywords like um, how do I quickly create classes, or or just typing in enroll or quit class, um, it will drive you to those articles um, so you can see how to manage class roster class rosters. Uh, all right. So this is uh, our the Zendesk site. And this has um, all those articles that I was just talking about, but it's also where you go um, if you don't want to talk to somebody, if you just want to say, I, I have a question, you can get back to me at some point in time. Um, there is a link there and you'll see it says um, create a ticket. That's that request help box. You click that, it will drive you through a form that you can fill out and somebody will from the support desk will respond back with, with your answer. If, however, you would like to, um, you're in the midst of rostering um, or doing quick class upload, it's not working, you wanna to talk to somebody right away, down in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, there is a, um, a link um, you can click and it will give you the option there for a phone call or um, doing using the, the, the chat bot. Um, not chat bot, that's not right. It's actually going to chat a real person. Um, it's not a bot. Um, and those will um, kick off, we'll have those turned on Monday. Is that right, Susan? Tier one support, I think, starts on Monday, yeah. So yes. right now, if you go out to this site, you're not going to, um, those will not be active. Nobody's going to be answering those calls right now. Um, and chat will not be turned on, but that will be turned on. You'll be able to contact us and um, and ask any any questions. The uh, toll-free number is on this slide. Um, it will also be available on um, within Zendesk by clicking on Call Us. Um, then searching within Zendesk, um, you can go into FAQs, you can go into resources, download documents. So that's where like the big, um, the TAMs and stuff are located. It's in resources, document downloads. But in the middle of that page, um, it says, what are you looking for? And this is a keyword search. So you can just type a few things of what you think it what might be called, like quick class, and it will bring up an article that you can then read and um, help walk you through that process. Next screen. All right, I'm not gonna read through all of these, um, but Krista, are there any, any points that you wanna make about um, items that are on this slide? 
Um, just highlighting that, again, if there's something that you think is a discrepancy with your assessment roster in NEO, as it appears, that would be a call to Medem's help desk. Um, but if you have any other questions around rostering NEO versus uh, Adam, you can also reach out to me. And the math and reading help desk is a different number. We just want to provide that reminder um, so that if you are seeking help for the main three year assessment, that is a different, different tech support number. And Cindy, um, saw your note in chat. Slides will be posted, um, and FAQs. Although I think we'll probably put some generic FAQs. We really didn't get a lot of questions, um, so we'll post those out here in, in a little while. Um, and your second question was about the DAC, and yes, the DACs were the um, we worked to build that um, the list, the DACs and provide credentials and sent those out to them. The DACs then will build their own SACs in Adam. And then teachers and proctors do not have their own logins. Um, they will use the test code um, and the proctor code to be able to administer the test and access the proctor dashboard. All right, if there aren't any other questions, we thank you for coming.